Um, I'm going to get us started with the panel right away. I just want to let you know also that I'm not going to be reading the entire bios for each of our presenters because, oh my God, <laughs> their trajectories are just absolutely immense and wonderful. But I do invite you to read the entire bios that we included in the program. So please do so. We're going to um, have 10 to 15, I'm sorry. 10 people would kill me if I say 15, 10 to 12 minutes for each presentation. You already have the instructions if you need um, translation um, for all of us here in person, but also all the people, all the other SWS members who are joining us online. And after that, we're going to have questions, of course, from the audience as time permits and have a dialogue here. Um, so again, this first session is trying to set precisely the parameters for what we're trying to do in the conference in terms of engaging with transnational feminism, in terms of engaging with the dialogue. We're going to start with Barbara Sutton uh, to my left. She's a professor at the Depart Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at the University at Albany. And her talk is going to be about the power of the green tide, feminist mobilizations for abortion rights in Argentina. So with you, Barbara Sutton. Hi everyone, it's great to be here with you. Thank you very much for joining us. I'd like to start by uh, reminding that eight years ago, I spoke at an SWS uh, plenary about abortion politics in Argentina. And at the time I titled my presentation, Clandestinas, Clandestine, and addressed the harm resulting from abortion criminalization, including dangerous and stigmatized abortions, pointing uh, to how different zones of clandestinity reproduce injustice in relation to categories of people constructed as other. While I focus on Argentina, I ask, even here in the US, as more and more restrictions are imposed on legal abortion, might more women for whom the increasingly restrictive procedures are not an option resort to clandestine alternatives? Finally, I noted that activists in Argentina were loudly demanding what might be radical in the US context, not only the criminalization, but fully funded abortion services. These observations um, are even more salient today in light of the mounting challenges to abortion rights in the United States from the insidious Texas SB8 law aimed at precluding most abortions to a slew of restrictions in other states to an impending Supreme Court decision that might severely undermine Roe v. Wade. So in this context, we might look to other places for ideas and inspiration. I'd like to draw your attention to Argentina, uh, where abortion politics have been mo moving in a different direction and where feminist mobilizations has yielded uh, tangible gains. This change, um, uh, sorry, for nearly a century, ab uh, abortion uh, was defined as a crime with few ex exceptions. This change in December, 2020, when Congress voted to legalize abortion and the law went into effect in early 2021. This legislation enacted a significant shift, moving from abortion criminalization, in, uh, except in cases of rape or risk to health or life, to permitting abortion on request through the first 14 weeks of pregnancy. After that period, abortions are still allowed for the previous exception grounds. Uh, through activist debates, it also became clear that legalization was necessary not only for women, uh, the often taken for granted subject of abortion, but also for persons with other gender identities who have the capacity to gestate. For example, trans men and non-binary individuals. This recognition was incorporated in the language of the new abortion law. Also important is the mandate for abortion um, services to be free of charge, whether in the public, private, or uh, social insurance sectors. This historic achievement was not merely the result of enlightened politicians, but the outcome of years and years of persistent organizing by movement activists who fought for legal, safe, and free abortion. Widely recognized by the green kerchiefs, 
um, that came to symbolize the growing movement, the green tide metaphor is not an exaggeration. Still, it can be easy to forget the myriad uh, barriers um, that activists face along the way. Social indifference and stigma, obstructionist changes, um, uh, obstructionist uh, conservative groups, uh, legislators that for a long time refused to get anywhere uh, near the issue, the influence of an Argentine Pope, difficulties even in relation to the exceptional abortions permitted by the old law, and more recently, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which created additional uh, obstacles on, on all fronts. That this hard-fought policy came amid uh, a devastating pandemic um, is a testament of feminist act activism, which never stopped. I just, it just adapted or took new forms uh, despite the difficulties. In Argentina, there are important historical precedents of mobilizing uh, in times of crisis. For instance, um, the crisis that surrounded the collapse of the economy two decades ago. And at the time, women played key roles um, in, in, in all of the many movements that uh, emerged. And as we argue with Elizabeth Borland, one can trace back some of the threats of contemporary abortion uh, mobilization to that period. Social movements can have powerful effects, even and especially um, in times of crisis. In fact, they can shape the direction of change. In Argentina, much of organizing during the pandemic happened online, but also uh, offline. For instance, uh, women workers across the country gather in assemblies in Zoom uh, and launch awareness uh, campaigns as well as offline actions. Feminist leaders in government uh, promoted policies to tackle magnified gender inequalities. Feminist activists denounced the intensified gender violence and facilitated that the, facil the pandemic facilitated. And women in poor neighborhoods organized communal meets in order to meet the increasing needs in their communities, among many other initiatives. Abortion rights activists continue pressing through adapted strategies from online actions to social distance performances, slide projections on buildings, and protests with face masks and different modes of mobility. They insisted that a change in abortion policy was required, especially in pandemic times, especially given the increased uh, obstacles to sexual and reproductive health. Rather than accepting the rhetoric that portrayed abortion as secondary in this context, um, activists doubled down saying, it is urgent, legal abortion 2020. They even dare say, our desire is urgent, legal abortion 2020, addressing abortion not just as a health issue, but as encompassing multiple desires, sexualities, and bodily rights. A key social and political actor in these efforts um, is a broad coalition launched in, in 2005, the National Campaign for the Right to Legal, Safe, and Free Abortion. Its symbol, the green kerchief, became widely adopted, even traveling to different parts of Latin America. In reflecting about the power of the green tide in Argentina, I'd like to highlight a few aspects that contributed to movement success, in my view. So one is a broad-based national coalition across social differences and political styles. The campaign compri comprised hundreds of organizations, including feminist and LGBTQ groups, labor unions, human rights organizations, and many other groups, um, including um, indigenous, healthcare workers, uh, students, educators, lawyers, journalists, cultural organizations, and many more. Also, a sustained focus on what the members of the coalition could agree on, which was comprised by the motto, sex education for choice, contraception to prevent abortion, legal abortion to prevent death. Um, but they also had autonomy for different organizations to imprint their own emphasis and strategy in ways that also spoke to different constituencies. There was also a potent symbol, the green kerchiefs, that can be easily adopted not only by established activists, but supporters too. Um, its use became widely uh, adopted and a visible indicator of uh, movement growth. Um, there also was the need to change the cultural conversation and not just focus on policy. Activists referred to what they call the social de decriminalization of abortion, which preceded legal change. 
They also had frames um, that were relevant to diverse groups beyond people with privilege, beyond those for whom choice would be sufficient. This meant sensitivity to inequalities, ability to adapt um, the demand to reflect their awareness, and, uh, and also the creation of um, democratic spaces to work through difference. Um, there was also uh, multiple levels of intervention, institutional and non-institutional, at the grassroots, as well as the highest levels of political power, from the streets to neighborhood spaces, to medical and educational institutions, the media, political parties, and the three branches of government. And connected to the last point, um, they use a multiplicity of strategies, lobbying, signature collection, artistic performances, educational uh, workshops, mass protests, conversations across movements, use of social media, accompaniment of people in need of abortion, and alliances with members of uh, the health sector, among others. In Argentina, it also uh, required forming transversal political alliances, including not making abortion the issue of just one party. Um, it also required nimble um, adaptation and synergy, for example, with emerging political and social processes uh, from the eruption of mass protests um, against gender violence to adaptation to the challenges of the pandemic. It also involved intergenerational organizing that benefited from the perspectives, political styles, experiences, and reach of different age groups and activist um, generations. And finally, it required uh, persistence, staying on course despite obstacles uh, with a long-term view. The abortion rights movement in Argentina situated abortion within a broad and emancipatory uh, democratic agenda. Going, sorry going beyond a notions of individual choice. Activists presented arguments based on social justice, human rights, and public health. They talked about the body as a territory that should be free from violence and oppressive regulation. <laughs> they used the tools of democracy to influence state and society while also claiming abortion as a democratic right. And part of what contributed to the movement's success was its ability to expose injustice bring people together across difference, learn from disagreement and become strong through diversity. It was the process of becoming a force that could no longer be ignored. Thank you. I want to show you my left side. It's not working. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Perfect and perfect timing. Thank you, Barbara. And being also from Latin America, I can attest to how incredibly influential the green tide has been all over the region. We are going to continue with Lisette Sinisterra. She's a professor at the Department of Social Studies at the Universidad Icesi. And the title of her talk is Es Cuestión de Dignidad. Mujeres Afrodescendientes Sosteniendo la Vida en Medio de la Muerte. It's a matter of dignity. Afrodescendant women sustaining life among death. So we welcome Lisette Sinisterra online to talk to us about this topic. Eh, buenos días para todas, todos y todes. Muchísimas gracias por invitarme a participar de este significativo congreso. Realmente me honra mucho acompañarles en este espacio. Básicamente, mi intervención está orientada a socializarles una iniciativa liderada y agenciada en su gran mayoría por mujeres afrodescendientes que desde la academia y procesos organizativos de base hemos constituido a través del programa Soy Porque Somos Pacífico Task Force, que es un programa que estoy gerenciando desde 2020. Hemos ubicado allí una respuesta desde abajo para afrontar los múltiples retos que han emergido en la región del Pacífico colombiano en este contexto del COVID-19. De igual manera, este programa que gerencio también puede ofrecer herramientas para la disciplina de la sociología que podría ser útil para futuros interventores e interventoras y en general para el campo de la intervención social contemporánea. Quisiera iniciar diciendo que el COVID-19, declarado pandemia por la Organización Mundial de la Salud en el año 2020, expuso la fragilidad y la falta de competencias del sistema socioeconómico y político colombiano para garantizar la vida de las comunidades afrodescendientes. A dos años de la propagación de este virus en Colombia, 
se ha evidenciado las inequidades históricas sufridas por el pueblo negro que se han profundizado en este contexto y ha tenido efectos devastadores sobre la región del Pacífico colombiano, que es el área donde hemos estado trabajando y concentrando nuestra intervención desde ahí. Es importante resaltar que el Pacífico colombiano se caracteriza por ser una región que concentra la mayor cantidad de población étnica en Colombia, lo que es población indígena y afrodescendiente, y es un territorio donde se evidencia bajos niveles de calidad de vida y de acceso a derechos fundamentales. En esta región las, com las comunidades tienen que luchar hasta para que se les respete el derecho a la vida, donde una mayoría de ellas no cuenta con acceso a servicios de salud o agua potable, electricidad, empleo, educación y vivienda digna. En esta región además eh, hay una persistencia también de la guerra que ha consolidado formas de acumulación por desposesión racializadas que han propiciado sufrimientos sociales, ambientales, de salud y seguridad. El impacto de esta pandemia global en el Pacífico colombiano agravó las condiciones de desigualdad social, especialmente de poblaciones étnicas. De acuerdo con el sistema de inteligencia epidemiológica que ha sido liderado por Pacífico Task Force, podemos ver, por ejemplo, cómo en agosto del 2021 las personas afrodescendientes tenían 21% más probabilidades de ser hospitalizadas, 88% más probabilidades de terminar en unidades de cuidados intensivos y 24% más riesgo de morir si se comparaba con otro grupo poblacional de nuestro país. Esto nos ha demostrado y ha evidenciado cómo la pandemia no ha impactado de forma homogénea a todos los grupos poblacionales, sino que pone mayor carga sobre aquellos sectores de la sociedad con vulnerabilidades preexistentes que de por sí ya es agravada por una crisis humanitaria que ha venido produciéndose por largas décadas de racismo estructural que ha conllevado al empobrecimiento, la exclusión, violencia y marginalización de la población negra en nuestro país. Es por ello que a raíz de esta eh, situación que les acabo de presentar muy brevemente, ha sido necesario que autoridades locales, organizaciones y sociedad civil articuláramos esfuerzos para proponer acciones que contribuyan a cerrar brechas de injusticia social que sufre esta población étnica. De esta manera, en el 2020 hemos creado esta iniciativa que hemos denominado Soy Porque Somos, Pacífico Task Force, que es una alianza, una alianza de liderazgos que articula esfuerzos académicos, organizativos y territoriales para desarrollar acciones estratégicas que desde un enfoque diferencial contribuya de alguna manera a mitigar esos impactos desproporcionados que ha venido generando el COVID-19 en la región pacífica. Uno de los grandes logros que hemos tenido como alianza ha sido precisamente que le hemos apostado a la conformación de un ecosistema de trabajo participativo y colaborativo entre diferentes actores del territorio para fortalecer su capacidad instalada y de respuesta. La coordinación de esta alianza ha estado a cargo del Centro de Estudios Afrodiaspóricos de la Universidad ICESI, del Proceso de Comunidades Negras, del Comité del Paro Cívico de Buenaventura y del Consejo Nacional de Paz Afrocolombiano. Estas cuatro organizaciones se articularon alrededor del principio de la filosofía africana Ubuntu, que es el Soy Porque Somos, y hemos contado con el apoyo de dos grandes líderes de filantropía mundial, que es la Fundación Ford y Open Society. Del 2020 al 2021, que es donde hemos desarrollado esta primera fase de este programa, logramos eh, trabajar alrededor de cinco líneas estratégicas en cuatro territorios que hemos eh, priorizado del litoral pacífico. Uno de estos territorios lo podemos encontrar como en Tumaco, en Quibdó, en Timbiquí y en Buenaventura. Voy a presentarles eh, muy brevemente cuáles fueron como las líneas estratégicas eh, con las que trabajamos y también cuál fue como el objetivo o la centralidad de liderar eh, estos procesos. Voy a tomarme entonces un tiempo más de ir un poco más despacio porque ahí me están diciendo las intérpretes que necesitan eh, tomarse el tiempo, entonces para que comprendan por qué también estoy bajándole al ritmo de, la, de, de mi presentación. 
La primera línea se llama seguridad alimentaria. Digamos que eh, uno de los puntos que más se recrudeció en el Pacífico colombiano fue los niveles de hambre eh, y de inseguridad y alimentaria, que por eso nos parecía importante acompañar desde este eh, frente. Aquí constu constituimos unos mercados con enfoques étnicos, unos mercados que estuviesen um, acorde a la base gastronómica de la población y este ejercicio, digamos, que lo lideraron sobre todo mujeres lideresas afrodescendientes de los territorios. Al tiempo que estábamos brindando una ayuda alimentaria a la población, al mismo tiempo estábamos acompañando o brindando una seguridad económica a mujeres afrodescendientes de la galería o plazas de mercado. Muchas de las mujeres afrodescendientes en nuestro país están ubicadas bajo un empleo informal y este sector fue fuertemente, eh, digamos, impactado. Por lo tanto, nos parecía importante acompañarles también desde ahí y el recurso económico se concentra en este sector al lado de las mujeres afrodescendientes. En la segunda línea, que se llama salud e higiene, algo que nos parecía muy importante era generar procesos de diálogo entre la medicina tradicional o ancestral con la medicina occidental. Propiciamos círculos de saberes, de reconocimiento y reivindicación desde lo colectivo de la salud propia de las comunidades afrodescendientes para promover procesos de cuidado y autocuidado en este contexto de pandemia. Ahí tuvimos procesos de articulación y fortalecimiento entre diferentes agentes territoriales de la salud. En la línea de educación también acompañamos porque una de las políticas del Estado colombiano fue cerrar inmediatamente las instituciones educativas o colegios, pero no brindó garantías a, a los docentes para que pudiesen acompañar a estudiantes desde la casa. Sobre todo que en el Pacífico colombiano hay una, una carencia muy fuerte de acceso a Internet y de a recursos tecnológicos. Por lo tanto, con, con las secretarías de educación y con líderes y lideresas sociales de los territorios, diseñamos dos estrategias de acompañamiento. Una, docentes para fortalecer competencias para transitar a una educación no presencial y otra, una estrategia que se llama Tejiendo Aprendizajes, que fue creada por una egresada del programa de Sociología de la Universidad ICESI, donde diseñamos una iniciativa vía llamada telefónica para acompañar y enseñar a estudiantes matemáticas, ciencias sociales, lenguaje y sobre todo brindar una atención psicosocial porque en los territorios se estaban presentando eh, alarmas con relación a la salud mental, emocional de muchos adolescentes y jóvenes de esta región. Con relación a la otra línea que denominamos adaptabilidad comunitaria, generamos procesos de capacitación y fortalecimiento de capacidades a liderazgos sociales para afrontar desafíos en sus territorios en este contexto de pandemia. Y finalmente, la línea del sistema de inteligencia epidemiológica fue desarrollada con las secretarías de salud de los territorios, secretarías de salud que fueron coordinadas principalmente por mujeres afrodescendientes, donde lográbamos posicionar una narrativa cuantitativa con enfoque étnico, racial y territorial para comprender la magnitud del impacto de este virus al pueblo negro y de esa manera ubicar respuestas para la mitigación. Estas líneas que muy brevemente les acabo de socializar y presentar potenciaron las capacidades de adaptación y respuesta de las comunidades al COVID-19. De esta manera, Pacífico Task Force ejecutó un programa que tuvo como objetivo apoyar y trabajar con los actores de los territorios comprometerse con el fortalecimiento de la capacidad local y operar bajo una estructura horizontal porque una, una gran participación de diferentes actores que nos, nos acompañaron a pensarnos esta estrategia y a desarrollarla a nivel territorial. Es así que esta alianza logra constituir un ecosistema regional de trabajo entre diferentes instancias. Aquí nos acompañaron alcaldías, universidades, instituciones educativas, 
organizaciones de base, médicos y médicas epidemiólogos, ingenieros e ingenieras y analistas eh, de datos que fortalecieron el trabajo en red para brindar una respuesta desde y para la región. De esta manera podemos comprender cómo esta eh, alianza con este programa que implementamos fue una iniciativa de afrontamiento a la pandemia con enfoque étnico-territorial que puso una mirada interseccional sobre las realidades de los habitantes de la región pacífica y sobre todo entender las maneras diferenciales en que se vive y sobrevive a la pandemia, incluyendo esos retos y violencias inherentes a ser afrodescendiente. Es importante mencionar que muchas de estas acciones eh, fueron precisamente lideradas por mujeres afrodescendientes ubicadas en diferentes campos de acción, desde lo académico y lo territorial, que también nos permite resignificar el rol y visibilizar su agencia en su capacidad de respuesta para afrontar este tipo de escenarios eh, problemáticos. Digamos que en este escenario de emergencia y de crisis humanitaria, las mujeres afrodescendientes han tenido un rol significativo para planificar contextos de vida en medio de geografías de muerte que le niegan el acceso a recursos que son esenciales para la vida. Eh, no obstante, digamos que en medio de todas estas rutas de segregación, de deshumanización y de muerte que nos toca afrontar como mujeres afro, hemos encontrado cómo también desde nuestras agencias políticas somos quienes lideramos el cambio a nivel local y logramos reinventar a través de múltiples estrategias en este contexto de pandemia para seguir luchando para preservar la existencia de nuestras comunidades. Debido a cuestiones de tiempo, cierro mi intervención con este último elemento. Quisiera también decir que esta iniciativa que hemos denominado Pacífico Task Force ha sido un caso de enseñanza muy importante para el programa de sociología y del Seminario de Intervención Social de la Universidad ICESI, que ha influenciado a estudiantes como futuros interventores e interventoras porque les retroalimenta su análisis en cómo podemos reinventar también nuevas formas de intervenir las problemáticas. Pacífico Tax Force como un modelo de intervención social deja muchas lecciones aprendidas por la manera en que se diseña y ejecuta una estrategia a nivel territorial. Lo dejo hasta ahí y muchísimas gracias eh, por su, por su <risa> atención. Excelente. Excelente. Muchísimas gracias, Lisset. Lisset, eh, desde Colombia, como ven, nuestro panel es totalmente internacional y transnacional. Thank you so much, Lisset. As you can see, our panel is completely transnational and international. We're going to continue. Uh, we're coming back to the room with Manisha Desai. Manisha is the head of the sociology department and professor and uh, she's also in sociology and Asian and Asian American studies at the University of Connecticut. And her talk is going to be, why feminist futures? What about a just present? Reflections on a Dalit women's collective farm in Tamil Nadu, India. Thank you so much. Let's welcome Manisha. Uh, good morning, everyone. And I want to first congratulate Roberta and the programming committee for putting together uh, this wonderful, hybrid, inclusive, diverse, uh, in-person and hybrid co conference, uh, two years after San Diego, so it's wonderful to see everyone. Uh, and the reason I talk about uh, why feminist futures uh, and why not the present, oops, <laughs> sorry about that, Uh, as all of you uh, probably have been dealing with the issue of time, and I think COVID made us all think about time in different ways, what time means, uh, what past, present, and future means. And for me, this was brought home very much uh, this morning when I learned of a very tragic death in my family. Uh, and so, you know, the present is very alive and here. And because I'm in the midst of feminist friends, who've been with me for decades. I'm here to present and I'm gonna do my best. Anyway, so I've been thinking about time because of all of those things. And I really wanted to trouble the notion of futures. And, you know, I think it's uh, Faulkner who talked about the past not even being past. 
uh, and history being very much alive and present. And so I've been thinking about, you know, present in a lot of ways and reading about uh, the way in which we think about temporality, particularly feminist temporality. And I think feminists have always reached back in terms of thinking about, you know, the kinds of uh, injustices and oppressions that women have uh, faced historically, transnationally, not just in this country, but everywhere. And as a result, feminist politics has always kind of drawn upon the past as a point of departure for present and for a better future. And so there's kind of this very linear notion of time. And as we've sort of been critiquing a lot of linearity, particularly of modernity and progress, I think we need to kind of also be thinking about the ways in which we as feminists think about time and drawing upon the past for a different kind of future. And so kind of playing around with those ideas, these are sort of still ideas in uh, formation. So I really uh, look forward to all of your comments and feedback as I think through uh, time and futurity. Uh, and so to me, futurity brings the present, unfortunately, into the future in the sense that you know, we are kind of constrained by our present, even as we think about the future. Uh, and as a result, one of the things I was thinking about was uh, Indian temporality, given that it's my own cultural background, uh, where time is this kind of timelessness, right? That you don't sort of divide it into tenses, past, present, future. There's a sense of kind of uh, cyclical sense of time. Uh, and that cyclical sense is also not just for human time, but also plants, animals, and things, uh, you know, that are both animate and inanimate. And so there's this kind of sense that things decay and there's chaos, but therefore there's also constant need for healing and recuperation uh, so that we don't sort of separate, you know, some kind of utopic future in which the present and the past will somehow be different, but that we need to do that work in the present. And as I was thinking about the living present rather than, uh, you know, the future, Obviously, Deleuze has written about the living present, and I want to also uh, sort of talk about the work that uh, Walker has done, bringing together Deleuze's notion of the living present, along with the new uh, materialist feminist who talk about, actually, particularly the work of Barad, who talks about intraactive materialities, because when we're thinking about the present, we're also thinking about materiality, and of course, with COVID, we all know specifically the materiality of the body, of suffering, of our relationships with other uh, others and that, that kind of suffering. And so for me, that kind of all came together to think about the living present, uh, which in some ways stretches between the past and the future. And it's a life present where we draw upon the past, but not necessarily for the future as much as for the current and for the present. Uh, and so the work then of uh, these uh, collectives of uh, Dalit women in particular in Tamil Nadu, and uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Indian caste hierarchy, Dalits uh, are, the name Dalit literally means the ones who are oppressed. And that's the self-identification of people who were in some ways uh, determined to be at the bottom of the caste hierarchy. And these are not only just Dalit women, but particularly Dalit widows. And I will tell you a little bit of why the fact that they're widows is also very important both in terms of temporality, but also the way in which they're kind of enacting this very cooperative occupation of farmland and kind of talking about, you know, what the present needs to be for them to survive and for them to flourish and heal. And so as I was thinking about time and, you know, reading these women's activism, I thought that actually what they were doing was really enacting a living present. And so I want to talk about uh, these multiple groups, and it's interesting that it's not just in one state in Tamil Nadu, I'm just talking about this one group, uh, but similar groups of uh, Dalit, particularly Dalit widows, have been taking over abandoned land, occupying the land, and farming it, and making it productive, uh, and then, of course, interestingly, as it happens in our neoliberal context, the moment it becomes uh, productive, then landlords who are absentee landlords or who have never been landowners suddenly say, oh, now you need to start paying us because it's productive land. Uh, but that's a different story, which I won't go into today. Uh, but so I wanna talk about these uh, Dalit Women's Cooperative. The first one I wanna talk about is the Dalit Women's uh, Collective that started actually in 1990s. And at that time, they were really just bringing women together. Most of the women, so almost 70%, of uh, women who work in uh, rural India are agricultural workers. Most of them don't own land, only about 13% actually own land. So this women's collective was bringing agricultural laborers to fight for 
uh, better wages for their work uh, against harassment, which is very often uh, the case, particularly in case of uh, Dalit women and Dalit widows in particular who are disinherited, don't have rights to land as it is, even uh, though legally, of course, men and women do have rights uh, to land, but those rights, as we know, never get actualized. And so this movement started back in the 90s, but then they were working more on agricultural uh, issues for farm workers. But it was the Dalit women themselves who began to occupy the land and began to cultivate it. And what they were doing, which is very also interesting, was actually dealing with climate change. And that's sort of another way in which we are seeing around the world that women's right to land is not only good for them and for their livelihood, of course, but also they're the ones who are also addressing issues of climate change on these lands because they're going back to practices that are not industrial agriculture because they don't have the resources. So they're using much more traditional uh, technologies, farming technologies. They're also uh, harvesting seeds and keeping those seeds together. So in some ways, their kind of occupation of the land and pooling resources and kind of bringing in uh, agricultural technologies that are not industrial technologies is also enabling them to actually address issues of climate change. And what's interesting about this is that they're all collectives, right? So when we think about collectives, we tend to think about, you know, the Soviet Union and collectives of the kinds that are top down. But these were what Bina Agarwal, who's a very well-known uh, feminist economist from India, talks about is that bottom up collectives. These are women who themselves decided that alone they couldn't do this, but if they pool their resources, because you need labor, you need resources, that they were able to do. So almost all of them are cooperatives. They're not, so again, it also tells us about the ways in which we might want to think about land rights, not as individual property rights, but as right to access land so that it gives you access to livelihood and not necessarily to property as we define property in terms of individual. Uh, property rights. Uh, so these Dalit women's cooperatives, I want to also just show you uh, some of what they've been doing. Okay. Uh, one of the things that they have done in the cooperative, in addition to working cooperatively on the land, is they've also kind of pulled resources and are getting resources. Uh, and so they manage cooperatively those resources and income. And what's interesting is because getting resources that is credit for uh, seeds and other things is difficult, They've also addressed with dealing with political power. So a lot of them have actually, because India has reservation at the local level of uh, governance, uh, a third of the seats are reserved for women. They've been actively seeking those seats. So just last year, a thousand women ran and 500 of them won seats at the local government level. So they've been you know, taking political power. Uh, they're working with uh, local administrations uh, around and uh, you know, not only around issues of governance, but around infrastructure, what kind of infrastructure is going to help a climate change in rural uh, communities. They've been dealing with issues of violence against women. And so what you see is that these are Dalit women who've historically faced a lot of violence, so they kind of draw upon those histories of violences, but they're working in the living present to address those and kind of, you know, just taking over. So they've taken over land. They're not asking people to give them land. They've taken over those land to make those lands, which were wasteland, so-called, more productive, uh, and to be able to deal with in the present issues of livelihood, issues of violence, issues of climate change, uh, and doing that collectively. <laughs> you know, a lot of the women's and some of the, uh, you know, uh, kind of little reports that I was reading on the website that were available talked about how it's not that easy that they have been Okay, one minute left, fighting with each other, but nonetheless, they're able to sort of go beyond and deal with those fights and come to certain conclusions. And I want to just show you some of the seeds, uh, some of, uh, you know, the work that they've been doing, uh, and actually also not just producing grains, because those are tough, but vegetables, which can give them, you know, more quickly access to resources. And these are some of the seed grains that they've been sort of uh, collecting, uh, local hybrid, rather than hybrid seeds, local seeds that aren't being uh, produced a lot and making those available. Uh, and so they've been, you know, kind of doing a lot of that work. In the end, what I, these cooperatives, as I said, are across India and a lot of different states to the extent that now the government of Kerala has its own uh, program to lease land to women so that they can actually be women farmers. And so what I want to end with, since I only have a minute, is to really talk about the way in which uh, I think what the women are doing in some ways by thinking about the present also to me, you know, harkens back to Gibson Graham's notion that when we think about hegemony and domination, it's very easy to think about the way in which the neoliberal 
uh, capitalist system completely dominates, but there are also all these spaces in which we find actually existing alternatives or what Eric Olin Wright also talked about real utopias that are now. And I think uh, it's important, particularly in this time when all of us you know, have so much suffering in the present to also think about the ways in which women and among the most marginalized women are together collectively showing us a path of the ways in which we can occupy, take over and enact uh, ways to kind of you know, live lives uh, that are meaningful and with dignity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manisha. And especially, you know, in the circumstances you are right now. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, now we're going to present a speaker who is also from um, the work that she's going to be presenting is also connected to SWS's Global Feminist Partner Program. And the aim of the program is to strengthen our association's international ties, particularly to the Global South, and share resources and experiences as well as activist and research knowledge across national and disciplinary lines. This year, SWS's Global Feminist Partner is the Women's Platform for Equality in Turkey. A chic. And we look forward to learning about Ishik's work from feminist lawyer and activist, Julia Bulbahar. The title of her talk is In Search of a Method for Feminist Organizing Against Masculinist Restoration, the Experience of the Women's Platform for Equality, Ishik. Welcome, Julia, and we're looking forward to hearing from your experience. Hoş bulduk. Ee, Türkiye İstanbul'dan iyi akşamlar diliyorum. Ee, salondaki e, katılımcıların fotoğrafını gönderdi sevgili Özlem. Onlara da iyi sabahlar diliyorum. Ee, şimdi PowerPoint'i açmaya çalışacağım ama e, başarabilecek miyim? Bilmiyorum. Bir saniyenizi rica edeceğim. Süremi bu şekilde harcadığım için kendime çok kızıyorum şu anda. Ekran paylaşımı açamıyorum. Peki açamayacağım herhalde ekran paylaşımını. Eşik zorunlulukların örgütlenmesi diyeyim. Ee, size Türkiye Kadın Hareketi'nin çok uzun tarihini değil, sadece asker, korkunç bir askeri darbe yaşadığımız e, 1980 askeri darbesini den sonunda kısacık 30 küsur yılda Türkiye Kadın Hareketi olarak yaptıklarımızı özetlemeye çalışacağım. 1986 yılında ilk defa kadına karşı şiddetin özel alana ait yapmıştık ve ondan sonra bir bir arkasına kadına karşı koruma emri yasasını içeren şiddet yasasını çıkarttık. Sonra ailenin reisini erkek olarak tanımlayıp evlilik içindeki Kadınlar, çocuklar, edinilen bütün malları erkeğin kontrolüne ve sahipliğine veren, 
E, erkek reisli aile modelini öngören medeni kanunu değiştirdik. Bütün haklar, bütün görevler e, ve tabii ki evlilik sırasında edinilen malları eşit paylaşılır kıldık. 2001 yılında yürürlüğe giren yeni Türk Ceza Kanunu'yla. Sonra Türk Ceza Yasası'nı değiştirdik 2004 yılında. Arkadan anayasa kadın platformunu oluşturduk. Anayasal e, eşitlik e, fikrine sahip çıkmak için. Şimdi bütün bu kazanımlar e, aynı zamanda Kadın Bakanlığı'nın kurulması, bakanlıklar içinde kadın birimlerinin oluşturulması gibi yani rüzgarı arkamıza aldık ve uçuyorduk Türkiye'de. Ne zamana kadar, ne zamana kadar bütün dünyada o sağcı geri tepme dediğimiz, eril restorasyon dediğimiz e, siyasal İslam'ın Türkiye'de iktidara gelmesiyle o intikam refleksi oluşturan sürece girdik aslında. Önce e, PowerPoint'e devam edemiyorum. Ekran paylaşımından zaten çıktım herhalde. E, önce e, 2010 yılında Ha, tamam o zaman. Çok iyi. Şimdi e, 2010, 2002'de iktidara gelen AKP e, hükümeti e, önce sessizce devlet mekanizmasındaki kadın örgütlerini kapattı. E, gizli bir e, eşitlik karşıtı ajanda oluşturdu. Ardından özellikle 2010 yılında e, ben zaten kadın erkek eşitliğine inanmıyorum demesiyle Erdoğan'ın ve kreş eken huzur evi biçer demesiyle e, toplumsal olarak paylaşılan kreşlerde, yaşlı yurtlarında bütün bakım hizmetleri kadının ev içi emeğinin üzerine bırakılmış oldu ve kadının en önemli kariyeri anneliktir denerek e, feminizm, LGBT hareket karşıtı aileyi, kadını aile içerisinde erkeğin reisliğine mahkum eden bir model hayata geçirmeye çalışıldı. Yani biz platformlar olarak yasal ve anayasal değişiklik örgütlerken bu sefer tekrar platformlar oluşturup e, bu kazanımları korumaya başladık. Burada slaytta gördüğünüz kürtaj yasaklanamaz platformu mesela 2012 yılında tuttu. Kürtajı hala bir yasal hak tutma halinde tutabilmek için büyük mücadele verdik Türkiye'de. Şu anda Türkiye'de 10 e, haftaya kadar kürtaj normal olarak e, normal e, gebeliklerde e, serbest Tıbbi zorunluluk varsa, suç sonuluk, sonucu, gebelik varsa daha farklı, daha uzun sürelerde kürtaj mümkün. Ama maalesef kürtaj yapacak hastane bırakılmadı. Fakat biz başarılı bir kürtaj kampanyası yürüttük, yasayı geri çevirdik. Fakat sinsi bir toplumda propaganda faaliyeti yürüyor, toplumsal itibarı kürtajın sarsılmaya çalışıyor ya da toplumsal destekçileri şu anda azaltılmaya çalışıyor. Yani hak kayıpları için örgütlenme 2012 kürtaj yasaklanamaz ile başladı. Arkadan İstanbul Sözleşmesi'ne bağımsız Türkiye'den bir uzman atanması için İstanbul Sözleşmesi platformunu oluşturduk. Arkasından çocuk cinsel istismarcılarına mahkum olup cezaevine atılanlara af getirilmesiyle ilgili teklife karşı çıktık. Çünkü af teklifi Çocuklarla cinsel ilişki yaşını 12'ye kadar indirme tehlikesi taşıyan bir teklif. Aynı şekilde şu anda resmi olarak hakim kararıyla 16 olan evlilik yaşında daha aşağı indirmeye yönelik bir teklif. O yüzden Türkiye Kadın Hareketi olarak 2016 yılından beri çocuk istismarcılarına af getirilmesini engellemeye çalışıyoruz. Durdurmaya çalışıyoruz bu girişimi. Aynı şekilde boşanmayı erkekler için kolaylaştıran ve dini hukuk açısından adeta boş ol dendiği anda, bir dilekçe verdiği anda 5 kuruş nafaka ödemeden boşanmasını sağlayacak olan bir pakete karşı da mücadele ediyoruz. Aynı zamanda İstanbul Sözleşmesi'nde çıkma girişimlerine karşı da mücadele ediyorduk ve bütün bunlar platformlar halinde birleşerek yaptığımız mücadelelerdi. Fakat sabah çocuk istismarcısına af, öğlen boşanan kadının yoksulluk nafakası, akşam İstanbul Sözleşmesi'ne saldırılar gibi dört bir yandan saldırıyla karşı karşıya kaldığımızda artık bu plat farklı adlarda platformlar olarak örgütlenmek imkansızlaşmıştı. Türkiye bizi ortak bir platformda buluşmaya ve eşiği oluşturmaya tek bir adla bu güncel saldırılara birlikte mücadele etmeye mecbur bıraktı. Başka bir şey yapamazdık, mecburen yaptık. Bu oluşturduk 
eşiği. Nasıl oldu? Covid döneminin e, getirdiği kapanma ve zorluklarda Zoom ve dijital iletişim olanaklarını keşfettik. Eşik, eşitiz olarak yaptığımız toplantılarda. Türkiye'nin her yerinden 200 aşkın e, kadın e, her hafta bir araya gelip e, sorunları tartışmış başladık. Sonra bu haklara yönelik saldırı geldiğinde bu Zoom toplantılarını eşik platformu olarak de- devam ettirmeye karar verdik. 1 Ağustos 2020'de eşik adıyla Türkiye kamuoyu önüne çıktık. Eşik e, bir ortak mücadele zemini oldu. Haklara yönelik saldırılara hep beraber karşı koyabilmek için. E, her Türkiye'deki çok önemli, yani 300'ün üzerinde kadın örgütü ve LGBT örgütün katılımından oluşuyor. Dernekler var, platformlar var, yapı içerisinde vakıflar var, her tür kadın grupları var, her tür örgütlenme bu arada eşikte bir arada. Eşikte çalışırken dikkat ettiğimiz iki önemli nokta var. Bir, tüm siyasi görüşlerden, siyasi partilerin kadın örgütleriyle eşit mesafede yoğun bir çalışma yürütmeye çalışıyoruz. İkinci önemli dikkat ettiğimiz nokta ise emek örgütleriyle, emek örgütlerindeki kadın birimleriyle mutlaka iletişim halinde birlikte çalışmak istiyoruz. Zaten emek örgütleri 150'nin üzerinde sendika, meslek örgütü de platformun destekleyicileri arasında. Ee, aralarında ara, yani kendine feminist demeyenlerin de olduğu ama ağırlıklı feminist bir kadın örgütü eşik. E, Türkiye'nin fay hatlarını oluşturduğu iddia edilen, bunu biraz tartışmak gerekir ama yerimiz burası değil. Kürt kadınlar, Türk kadınlar, Alevi kadınlar, dindar kadınlar, e, din, layık, dindar olmayan kadınlar, ev kadınları, iş kadınları, okuma yazma bilmeyenler, akademisyenler, Türkiye'nin kadın hareketinin çeşitliliğini yansıtan bir yapı içerisinde beraberiz. Tamamen gönüllü emekle çalışıyor eşik, hiçbir yerden fon almıyor. Ee, değişik konularda çalışma grupları var. Bu grupların temsilcilerinden oluşan bir koordinasyon şeklinde de yönetiliyor eşik yapısı. Bir yılda o kadar çok iş yaptık ki az önce saydım size kampanyaları, çocuk cinsel istismarı, boşanan kadının yoksulluk nafakası, İstanbul Sözleşmesi'ne sahip çıkma girişimleri ki hala davalar ve e, söylemlerimizle İstanbul Sözleşmesi'ne sahip çıkmaya devam ediyoruz. Önümüzdeki günlerde duruşmamız var İstanbul Sözleşmesi ile ilgili. Günde en az üç kadının öldürüldüğü bir ülkede yaşıyoruz. Doğal olarak konularımız kadın cinayetleri buna karşı da hem iktidarı hem muhalefeti göreve çağıran kampanya yürüttük ve buna günde en az 3 kadını öldürülüyor bu artık bir cins kırım dedik nafaka hakkı için kadınların mücadelemiz devam ediyor bu çerçevede ne yaptık mesela ekstra yaptığımız çalışmalardan bir tanesi de şu meclisi izledik bir yıl boyunca meclisi izledik ve şunu gördük. Tek adam yönetimleri, otoriter yönetimler demokrasiyi baltalarken aynı zamanda muhalefetin ve toplumun söz hakkını mecliste kısıtladığında yani parlamenter demokrasiye özgü mekanizmalar çalıştırılmadığında kadınlar da sesini duyuramıyor. Toplumun hiçbir kesimi duyuramıyor, kadınlar da duyuramıyor ve eşit olarak bütün bir yasama boyunca 10 rapor yayınlayarak meclisi izledik. Şöyle bir fark yarattığımızı söyleyebiliriz. İlk 15 günlük raporumuzda mecliste kadına yönelik şiddetten ve kadından bahseden bahsedilen süre 57 saniyedir. 10. rapora meclisin sonuna geldiğimizde bu saatleri bulan katılım oldu. Demek ki en azından muhalefeti bir miktarda iktidarı bu anlamda değiştirme gücü elde etti. Eşik. Aynı şekilde farklı bir iş daha yaptık. Tamamen gönüllü emekle 600'e yakın milletvekilini yasama yılı boyunca tek tek takip ettik ve partilere ve bu milletvekillerine puan verdik. Hangi mekanları ziyaret ediyorlar? Futbol kulüplerini mi yoksa kadınların yoğun olarak yaşadığı yerleri? Hangi şakaları yapıyorlar? İstanbul Sözleşmesi'ne sahip çıkıyorlar mı? Böyle bir soru rehberi oluşturduk ve bütün milletvekillerini iktidar muhalefet demeden takip ettik, raporladık. Bu da çok önemli bir eşit faaliyetiydi. Ee, çok sayıda eşik çalışmasından e, bir tane örnek size vermek istiyordum, göstermek o şeyi. Ama onu burada bulamadım. 
E, bir saniye bulabilirsem görmenizi çok isterim onu. E, bir halka yaptık Türkiye'de kadınlar olarak, mor halka olarak e, değerlendirilen bir halka. E, kadın hareketine karşı, kadın kazanımlarına karşı çıkanlar o halkayı çok kullanıyorlar. Şöyle bir Moğol halka kendi fotoğraflarımızın etrafına sosyal medyada koyduk. O Türkiye'yi çok iyi anlatıyor aslında. Bir yerde İstanbul Sözleşmesi yazıyor. Bir yerde 6284 şiddet yazısı yazıyor. Bir yerde Türk Ceza Kanunu çocuk istismarcılarına af yazıyor. Eşeği de çok iyi anlatan bir görsel aslında. Bu eril restorasyonu savunan sadece sağ muhafazakarlar değil onların sosyalistler arasında bile uzantıları var. Mor halkalılar diye isim takmaları da biraz bu yüzden oldu. E, eşik olarak e, uluslararası e, buluşmalara çok önem verdik. İstanbul Sözleşmesi için sözleşmenin risk altında olduğu ya da top, kamuoyunda e, itibarsızlaştırmaya çalışıldığı e, Doğu Avrupa ülkeleriyle ortak e, Zoom toplantıları yaptık. E, onların fotoğrafını şurada görebiliriz. Aynı şekilde ulusal, ulusal üstü bir e, organizasyon olarak onlarca onlarca dünya kadın e, örgütü, dünyadan kadın örgütüyle beraber Afganistanlı kadınlar için dayanışma eylemleri yaptık. E, eşik olarak ben sızdıramayacağım buraya e, yaptıklarımızı. Bu anlamda ödüller de aldık. Ama bir şeyin altını çizmek istiyorum. Bu fotoğrafa çok iyi bakmanızı e, tavsiye edeceğim. Gerçi rüyalarınıza girebilir. Altı birbirinden yakışıksız erkek arkadaşla karşı karşıyayız burada. Bu beyefendiler e, Türkiye'nin ana muhalefetinin, ana muhalefet partisinin başını çektiği muhalefet ittifakının e, ortak, e, gelecekte kuracakları ortak hükümetin ilkelerini saptayan yazım heyeti. Eşit olarak o kadar çok uğraştık ki şuraya bir tane kadın temsilci göndermeleri için bu altı siyasi partinin başaramadık. Her birisiyle ayrı ayrı görüştük, bunu başaramadık. O yüzden bizim eşikteki ana çalışmalarımızdan bir tanesi, konuşmacılardan birinin de sorusuydu. Daha adil bir gelecek için, daha iyi bir gelecek için feminist örgütlenme diyoruz ama bugün ne olacak diye. Aslında eşikte biz ikisini birden yapmaya çalışıyoruz. Birincisi iktidarın kadın haklarına yönelik saldırılarını durdurmaya çalışıyoruz. Kısmi olarak başarılı gidiyor bu çalışmamız. Tabii ki çok umutlu değiliz. Artık bir şeyleri kaybedeceğimiz belli. Çünkü denge ve fren mekanizmaları olmayan bir iktidarla karşı karşıyayız. Ama en azından çocuk istismarcılarına af gibi, boşanan kadının yoksulluk nafakası gibi konuları biraz erteletebildik. Ertelettikçe kar sayıyoruz milyonlarca kadın ve çocuk için. Ama bununla yetinemeyiz eşit olarak. Çünkü bu fotoğrafta da gördüğümüz gibi hepsi geleceği kurmak isteyen muhalefet partilerinin ana geleceği biçimlendirecek e, teknik heyetlerini bile erkeklerden, silme erkeklerden oluşturduğunu gördüğümüz zaman biz muhalefet üzerinde de çalışmalarımızı sürdürüyoruz ki geleceğin iktidarını da bugünden biçimlendirmeye ve cinsiyetçilik karşıtı olarak kadın erkek eşitine gerçekten inanacak bir şekilde dönüştürmeye çalışıyoruz. İşimiz eşit olarak Türkiye Kadın Hareketi olarak kolay değil. Çok yönlü baskılar altında e, Türkiye Kadın Hareketi hani çok güçlü bir kadın hareketi. Belki bu baskılar yüzünden bu kadar güçlüyüz. On binlerce kadın 8 Mart'larda, 25 Kasım'larda sokaklara dökülüyor. Geceleri e, yürüyüşler yapıp bütün barikatları açıyor. Ama bunun bedelini e, her gün en az üç kadın canından olarak ödüyoruz Türkiye'de. E, daha geçen gün eşik, de bileş, eşik bileşenlerinden de olan Roza Kadın Derneği, Türk Kadın Arkadaşlarımız Derneği ağır e, gözaltı saldırılarıyla uğraştı. Bugün İçişleri Bakanlığı, LGBT örgütlerine gerçekten ağır tehditlerde bulunan açıklamalar yaptı yine. Bu baskılar altında e, Türkiye Kadın Hareketi olarak ve eşik olarak örgütlenmeye birbirimizle dayanışmaya çalışıyoruz. Eşik hem bugünkü iktidar politikalarını eleştirmek ve dönüştürmek için, en azından durdurmak için, hem geleceğe yönelik 
geleceği biçimlendirmek için sistemli bir çalışma yürütüyor. Ama en önemlisi binlerce kadın için aslında hem umut hem her çarşamba karar alma toplantılarımıza katılan bazen 100 bazen 200 kadın olarak bir arada toplanıyoruz. Her çarşamba 100. toplantıyı geçtik bu arada. Bu kadınlar için birbirimizle olmak bu zor zamanlarda iktidardan yönelik hakaretlere, muhalefetten yönelik umursamazlıklara, erkek kibrine maruz kalarak, birbirimize dayanışarak yürümeye ve Türkiye'yi değiştirmeye çalışıyoruz. Kadın hareketinin siyasi sahiplerle, e, fon örgütlenmeleriyle değişik nedenlerle bölünme çabasına, bölünme girişimlerine karşı. En önemlisi de patriarkanın bizi bölme girişimlerine karşı. Ortak bir slogan e, bunu paylaşmaya ve çoğaltmaya çalışıyoruz. E, kadın kadının kurdudur sözüne karşı. Türkiye Kadın Hareketi'nin e, özellikle Suriyeli kadınlarla ortak mücadelesi sırasında üretilmiş bir slogan olan Olya. Kadın Kadının yurdudur sloganını e, paylaşmaya ve hissetmeye çalışıyoruz. Ve hissettirmeye çalışıyoruz. Dayanışma içinde birbirimize yurt olmaya çalışarak Türkiye'de. Eşiğin bence en önemli e, katkısı Türkiye Kadın Hareketi'ne kadın kadının yurdudur e, felsefesini ve dayanışmasını her gün biraz daha yükseltmeye çalışmak. Çok teşekkür ederim. Umarım süremi aşmamışımdır. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Holya, so much. We ran, we ran a little bit over time, uh, but we understand. Holya got excited with this incredible experience that uh, she just shared with us from Turkey. Thank you so much, Holya. Thank you so much to um, the incredible um, team of translators that we have today helping us out with this transnational conversation. We're going to continue. Yeah. Yeah, let's give them a round of applause. This is incredible, incredible work. We're going to continue. We're coming back to the room again, and we're going to continue with S.M. Rodriguez. She is, they are, sorry, Assistant Professor of Gender Rights and Human Rights at the London School of Economics. And her, their talk is about African anti-carceral feminisms for the colonial futures. Welcome, SM. Thank you so much for being here. All the way from London. <laughs> thank you, and thank you uh, to SWS for the honor of joining this presidential plenary with such inspiring colleagues. Um, I'm going to jump right in because I'm genuinely at 12 minutes. Um, so just as coloniality describes the condition stemming from but outlasting the bounds of colonialism, African women's leadership in anti-colonial rebellion define, uh, defy time and space. The unbounded border resistant lives and wisdoms of those enduring imprisonment, suppression and extra legal punishment reveal a colonial carceral diaspora from which African people have named the prison as the preeminent sphere of social death globally. Both the prison and the notion of a universal womanhood exist as colonial inventions, dually repressing African women's liberatory practice. While pre-colonial Africa featured gender diversity in political structures like the female king of uh, Ibo land or armies of women in Dahomey, coloniality introduced a limited conceptualization of womanhood. And for this, you can see Wando Achebe's work or Ifea Madiumi, Oyeranke Oyewumi, et cetera. That narrow womanhood is an epistemic imposition invented by European colonialism to cement a political binary of a public private sphere and a socially enforced sex binary that invisibilizes and harms countless people, including those who are born with chromosomal or genital difference as they are intersex, or who reject the assignment of one sex or gender to transition or live more expansively as they are transgender. 
The ultimate purpose of the social construction of gender difference is not just social control, by, uh, whereby the world is divided neatly into these two classes of people for the sake of cultural order, but also domination of one class by the other along racialized lines and by means of exclusion and invisibilization. It silences the political presence of the feminized. The silencing of African political womanhood occurs through cultural hegemony, as Patricia Hill Collins demonstrates, where a taken for granted ideology of the natural order of gender permeates various interacting social institutions. However, more centrally for this essay, it also occurs through overt force. I situate African political womanhood as a form of insight into and resistance against the form, the force of the colonial carceral. Developed by Mekin in 2015, the framework of the colonial carceral describes the temporal, material, and philosophical connections between European colonial power and the advent of the carceral society as marked by the development of prisons. Methodologically, I consider the autobiographies memoirs and poetry of women of African descent who have been imprisoned on and away from the continent of Africa. This literature, according to Marciana Nafula Were, is grounded in counter-narrative practices developed to reject, quote, colonialism, apartheid, and post-independence autocracy. But for me, this is both an Afrofuturist and a Black feminist ontological endeavor. Ja Elise Sayers points to Afrofuturism as an imaginative project that creates a less constrained future for African people while reorienting the quote, black Atlantic temporality toward both the production of futures and development of counter memory. It is cumulative time rather than passing time. And this way I'm actually um, also nodding to Manisha's uh, reference to the Deleuzean sense of time. Similarly, reimaginative of the essence of time, Vivian Salehana charts out Black feminist hauntology, which describes the ever-changing formations of anti-colonial resistance as transcendent and metamorphical shape-shifting. Although white supremacist institutions harm us, Black feminism haunts white supremacy. These revolutionaries all continue to name the roots of oppression and call for radical collectivity against the co-constitutive white supremacist forces of imperialism, cis-heterosexism, racism, and capitalism. The narratives of their incarceration interweave the complex harms, physical, spiritual, material, and sexual that shape racialized subjection. More grippingly, the perseverance of their messages, which defy temporal bounds and spatial borders, inspires a future of abolitionist movements globally. By abolition, I do not mean to limit the message of political prisoners to the eradication of prisons, but rather I point to a decolonial project of penal abolition, the eradication of systems of punishment and their supportive epistemic contra constructs that render people disposable, surplus, or reducible to our capacities to be exploited. In this way, I'm taking coloniality as a meta language, as may Sylvia Winter, who would ground racialization, capitalism, gender division, and other dehumanizing social processes as representations of the logic to colonize, seize, hierarchize, control, discipline, regulate. But it is important to keep in mind when we think abolition that these women who rally were caged for rallying, not rallying against their cages alone. That is to say that it is the system of capitalism that has anarcho-feminist Lucy Parsons address a Chicago crowd in 1886 to question liberty vis-a-vis -vis homelessness, starvation, and other political economic choices of the United States. It is the developing creation of the criminal class that led her in the 1890s to protest penal reform as a ruse disguising the class warfare embedded in the social construction of and moral panic around the criminal. She, like Hajia Gambo Sawaba in Nigeria, continues through and despite multiple arrests. Gambo spends the 1950s until the new millennium fighting and organizing for freedom from oppressive governance during and after colonialism in Nigeria. She, like many of these women, defies the public-private man-woman binary divide and suffers righteously for it, often arrested for crimes of, quote, public speaking and consorting with men in public. She spends considerable time in prison where she rallies her fellow encaged sisters. 
However, it's not just the righteous mutinous spirit that connects these women, but also the overstated violence of the state in its attempt to quiet them. Janine Africa doubles down when remembering the pain. She says, they were ordered to break us, but it didn't work. No matter what they did, they were not going to break us. And you would think she was speaking with Jane Mutoni uh, Mara, a, a Kenyan freedom fighter detained with the Mau Mau at 15 years old. Jane continues to fight the imperialists in England in 2016 when she finally wins reparations for the abuse of her people, detained in camps and sexually tortured en masse. She recalls the graphic violence she survived at the hands of the English for providing meals to those who were fighting for the dignity and freedom of our people. Similarly, fighting for dignity, Stella Nianzi's protests led to a cyber harassment charge and imprisonment after critiquing the Ugandan president's wife. She names the role of criminalization in sequestering the poor and political women in her book of poetry, No Roses from My Mouth, Poems from Prison, that was published in 2020. However, before and after imprisonment, she dedicates her research and activism to the liberation of gender minorities and all Ugandans from corruption and tyranny. Stella is particularly well known for her advocacy of, uh, for African women and same-sex loving people. And for this, she faced considerable violence like being arrested for assembly. Less than a year after the publication of Nyansi's book of poetry, Shakira Njukam, a woman in, in Cameroon, remarks upon the hell of being detained in a men's prison, notably not unlike Asada Shakur had been in the United States. Shakira, Shakira, um, uh, Shakira's arrest was for public indecency and failing to produce identification, despite being out to dinner at the time of arrest. Uh, sorry, for merely existing in public as a trans woman. And she was convicted of attempted homosexuality, despite the fact that she was just at dinner. Shakira reminds us that the public existence of personal and political diversity in expression or thought the uncategorizable is the essence of protest against coloniality, which defines in order to exploit. The colonial carceral diaspora connects manners of prison repression, of political repression under the logic of order and the mechanism of isolation. However, the comradeship and coalition seen in African political womanhood before, during, and after imprisonment moves us to possess and destroy racial capitalist domination. As Vivian Salahana writes, the sociological ghost I call upon is a black feminist. I see the creation of a future built through mutuality, a praxis of recognition, redistribution of our collective resources, energy, and time that can birth the abolitionist imagination. And it is a distinctly feminist task. When Hajia Gamba Suaba takes on a scuffle on behalf of a girl who cannot fight, she says, I have bought this fight from you. The display of comradeship continues lifelong as she struggles on behalf of women and girls throughout Northern Nigeria, and she is jailed 16 times for the political fights she buys. When Ugandan scholar activist Stella Nyansi suffered a miscarriage in prison, her saviors were fellow prisoners. Sisterhood is forged on that prison floor, she writes, as she terrifyingly describes the blackouts both of the prison's electricity and of her own consciousness as she loses blood and her blood pressure rises. Nyansi shares that her, uh, that prisoners gave her water, pads, toilet paper to collect her blood, resources that were rationed to, her, or to them. And they protect her privacy and they hold up blankets as shields, they lift her and blanket her limp body. The haunting recollection whispers mutual aid as I read. The practice of providing for others needs and innovative and necessary interventions that the state rendered impossible, unnecessary, or excessive. It is a collective strength that sustains African political womanhood. Timeless, boundless, and borderless, a resistance reprise rings out from the colonial carceral diaspora, and these sisters connect the ar archipelago of cells with concerted resolve. Because as the Trinidadian activist Claudia Jones says, after the United States and the UK legitimized trafficking her to London, what is an ocean between us? We know how to build bridges. Decades before Asada Shakur sits in Alderson prison camp, Claudia sits there waiting to be deported under the Subversive Activities Control Act of 1950. I imagine that their spirits meet when Asada writes, it is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. 
We must love each other and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. See, the secret to combating these overlapping crises that we currently face, particularly for the most marginalized, is not found in this current necropolitical governance. It is not to celebrate when only those on the margin suffer. It is found in the movement within the most deprived margins who struggle together to feed each other when the funding for food goes to war and policing, who bind each other's bleeding wounds from state violence and neglect. And this open secret has been passed on from generation to generation, shape-shifting for resilience. As mutual aid seen in community-based queer organizing, collectivization for the lives and dignity of disabled people and the indigenous resistances that move like borders are imagined after all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you so much. Uh, something I just discovered that is an added advantage of having a hybrid meeting is that I can coordinate with our coordinators through Zoom. <laughs> so I've been doing that because, as you know, we're already over time. So we decided since we have enough time for lunch, we're going to go until noon. Okay, so that we also have time for an exchange with all of you so that you can ask questions, both the people who are in person here at the conference, but also uh, all the SWS members who are joining us virtually. Okay, so just so you know how we're doing in terms of time. Thank you again, Sam. That was a beautiful, beautiful reflection and talk connected to all the themes that we've been talking about. And there are several themes that as you have uh, seen as well, are emerging from the conversation already, right? So intersectionality, sorority, coalition building, strategic usage of different tools, including social media and so on. The last um, speaker in our plenary is uh, a fellow Dominican. Yay! <laughs> Caterina Tatiana Cabrera Cordero, we call her Katy. She is uh, the Encargada de Juventud, the person in charge of the Youth Committee at Confederación Nacional de Mujeres del Campo, CONAMUCA, which is the um, rural women's organization, so it's a huge federation in the Dominican Republic. Her talk is titled, Debemos Luchar por un Mundo Donde Socialmente Seamos Iguales, Humanamente Diferentes y Totalmente Libres. We must fight for a world where we are socially equal, humanly different, and completely free. Welcome, Kathy, from the Dominican Republic. Welcome to the conference. Bueno, muchísimas gracias por la invitación. Para mí es más que un honor estar acá compartiendo experiencia, pero también aprendiendo en ese intercambio que luego entonces se expresará en lucha, en resistencia y en conocimiento y empoderamiento de todas las mujeres. Entonces, para mí es más que un placer. Eh, yo voy a estar hablando de las movilizaciones eh, feministas futuro, eh, pero no quisiera dejar pasar por alto una frase que a mí me encanta, que es de Rosa Luxemburgo que dice que debemos de luchar eh, por un mundo donde socialmente seamos iguales, humanamente diferente y totalmente libre. Y yo creo que en busca de esa libertad, eh, nosotras las mujeres hemos estado involucradas en todos los procesos reivindicativos a favor de nuestro derecho y con la resistencia en la frente. O sea, la resistencia ha sido el pilar el camino que nosotras como mujeres hemos trazado para poder conquistar, para poder arrebatar los derechos que hoy tenemos. Y si hacemos un análisis, eh, como lo que, hemos, lo que hemos venido escuchando en el día de hoy, de las excelentes exposiciones que me antecedieron, hemos avanzado mucho en materia de derechos. Eh, no podemos negarlo eh, porque hemos luchado para eso. Pero también tenemos muchos retrocesos en nuestra América y mucha amenaza de retroceso. Y yo creo que esta conferencia debe hacer el llamado 
a vigilar eh, ese proceso de retroceso que se viene dando en nuestra América y qué podemos hacer nosotras eh, para unar fuerza, eh, para crear ese lazo de unidad, eh, para denunciar todos esos inicios de retroceso que se han querido dar en nuestra América luego de, de, una, eh, de avances significativos que hemos tenido. Y lo hemos visto, estado que estaba despenalizado el aborto, las amenazas que hay en busca de una penalización. Eh, otros países como, como el mío, eh, donde el aborto es penalizado en todas sus situaciones eh, y que en la actualidad hemos estado librando una lucha para que se despenalice el aborto en tres causales, para garantizar la vida, la salud, la dignidad de todas las mujeres, pero principalmente para nosotros, para las mujeres campesinas, para las mujeres que no tenemos la posibilidad eh, de practicar no, un aborto en algún hospital, que el Estado garantice nuestra vida, para que nuestra vida eh, eh, tenga un valor eh, como ciudadana y que no se nos siga viendo como alguien incapaz de tomar decisiones en momento oportuno. Y yo creo que nosotras las mujeres tenemos todas las actitudes para saber tomar decisiones sobre nuestro cuerpo, sobre nuestro territorio, llámese nuestra tierra, nuestro pedacito donde producimos alimentos y también nuestro cuerpo para decidir qué queremos o no. Yo tengo aquí, esta es nuestra lucha actual. Las causales deben de estar, el Estado debe garantizar derechos a favor de nosotras, a favor de todas las mujeres. Entonces, eh, voy a compartir pantalla, eh, voy a ver si se me da. Yo soy una joven campesina, eh, vivo en un campo, eh, soy afrofeminista, eh, estamos involucrados en todo este proceso de reivindicaciones a favor de las mujeres, eh, eh, a favor de las mujeres, principalmente campesinas, y conocer experiencias como las que se han estado mostrando es más que gratificante. Yo voy a estar eh, hablando de las movilizaciones feministas, como le, le había dicho en busca de ese proceso reivindicativo que nosotros hemos venido haciendo históricamente. Eh, los movimientos feministas somos la fuerza viva, somos muy activas, que difícilmente van a poder separar, porque tenemos bien claro hacia dónde vamos, qué estamos buscando y qué tenemos que conseguir para garantizar derechos. Eh, como punto, que es lo mínimo que nos pueden dar los estados el derecho a una vida, a una salud, a una dignidad. Y como mujeres tenemos ese, ese, ese fervor de derecho. La marea feminista creció. Ya no es la misma de, de años atrás. Ya no se ve el feminismo como se veía antes, como de un grupito. Creció. Somos millones en el mundo. Somos millones que estamos exigiendo eh, una vida digna. Eh, que la vida de las mujeres esté en el centro que las decisiones que tomen los estados siempre eh, tomen en cuenta que nosotras existimos y resistimos. Eh, yo creo que el mayor avance de los movimientos feministas y que y a la vez también sigue siendo todavía un reto es la diversidad, es la capacidad que hemos tenido de diversificar nuestra lucha, de la incorporación eh, eh, de diferentes eh, diversidades. Estamos las campesinas, estamos las indígenas, estamos las mujeres afrodescendientes, estamos la comunidad LGBTQ. ¿Por qué la diversidad? Porque la unión es la fuerza. Y lo hemos demostrado en las últimas movilizaciones, no solo aquí en República Dominicana, sino estuvimos viendo el ejemplo de Argentina, Colombia, muchísimas, muchísimos países que han podido avanzar en el trayecto de las movilizaciones y que esas movilizaciones han traído cambios significativos para las políticas de cada uno de los estados. Falta mucho, sí. Falta mucho por hacer, pero vamos encaminando. Y como le decía ahorita, tenemos que tener 
eh, ojo visor, porque si bien hemos logrado conquistas que históricamente hemos venido eh, batallando, también tenemos amenaza de retroceso en países donde se ha avanzado en materia de derecho. Hoy hay amenaza de retroceso porque las élites de poderes y los grupos conservadores están ocupando parte significativa en la toma de decisiones de los estados. Entonces tenemos que estar bien alerta eh, y bien pendiente a los procesos que se vienen dando en nuestra América. Eh, nosotras, yo pertenezco a un movimiento campesino internacional, eh, le llaman la vía campesina y como hubiera dicho anteriormente, a la organización que pertenezco, una organización campesina, eh, somos una confederación eh, que estamos articuladas a nivel nacional en la República Dominicana, que estamos eh, comprometidas con la producción de alimentos sanos, pero también estamos comprometidas con la lucha a favor de la vida de las mujeres en los campos, en nuestro territorio, con la agroecología como modelo de producción, con la soberanía alimentaria, pero también eh, reivindicando nuestro derecho como mujer a la tenencia a los bienes naturales como tierra, agua, semilla, pero también a servicios básicos, salud, educación, y a un aborto gratuito, seguro, eh, que el Estado garantice eh, una vida digna para, para nosotras. Perdón. Nosotras como un movimiento campesino hemos estado en la construcción de un feminismo campesino popular. Eh, conociendo este concepto, vamos a tener la claridad de la historia que hemos vivido. Eh, nosotras cuando hablamos del feminismo campesino popular, Hablamos de esa construcción que nosotras como mujeres tenemos a favor de nuestro cuerpo, eh, pero también a favor de la tierra. Cómo nosotras luchamos para, para combatir ese cambio climático que está bien palpable ante nuestra vista. Y nosotras tenemos un lema que dice que las campesinas y los campesinos podemos enfriar el planeta siempre y cuando las mujeres tengamos Acceso a tierra para producir alimentos, acceso a servicios básicos y acceso a que el Estado garantice nuestra vida, nuestra salud dentro de nuestro territorio sin la privatización y sin el desalojo forzoso que se viene dando en nuestro territorio. Es importante tener claro eh, que somos muchas mujeres las que venimos construyendo eh, la forma de, de estar en este mundo. O sea, nosotros hemos venido históricamente construyendo eh, un mejor vivir para nosotros y en ese caminar entonces estamos andando. Somos nosotras las protagonistas eh, de la construcción de la soberanía alimentaria. Fuimos nosotras las mujeres las que empezamos a hablar de soberanía alimentaria, de seguridad alimentaria, de reforma agraria, de una vida digna, de que las mujeres tengamos derecho a título, a tierra, para producir nuestros alimentos y que la juventud no podamos seguir migrando, no tengamos que seguir migrando del campo hacia la ciudad porque en nuestro campo no se estén implementando política pública a favor eh, de nosotras. El feminismo campesino popular es una propuesta que venimos construyendo de forma orgánica desde la base para transformar esta realidad de igualdades en que vivimos, de desigualdad en que vivimos, perdón. Así vamos construyendo y creando comunicación vital con el sentido de la vida. Eh, yo siempre he dicho eh, que la pandemia COVID-19 vino a evidenciar lo que nosotras como movimiento feminista estábamos denunciando. Y yo creo que vino a, a demostrar que nosotros estábamos en lo cierto cuando decíamos que las desigualdades son notorias y que nosotras las mujeres siempre tenemos la brecha de desigualdad en una sociedad con un sistema injusto, con un sistema que sigue oprimiéndonos, con un sistema eh, patriarcal, capitalista, que sigue eh, violentando nuestro derecho por la razón de ser eh, sistema, que sigue contradiciendo entonces nuestra postura de ser mujer en una sociedad. Y mientras eh, las grandes empresas 
cuando se descubrió el COVID-19, eh, pararon muchas de trabajar, otras se hicieron eh, mucho más millonarias y muchas de nuestras mujeres sufrieron más violencia porque tuvieron la obligación de estar en casa con su agresor y muchas de nuestras mujeres campesinas perdieron la vida eh, porque se le impuso eh, estar y permanecer con su agresor en casa. Mas, sin embargo, nosotras como mujeres permanecíamos produciendo alimentos, sembrando para llevar la comida que todos los días llegaba a la mesa de la humanidad. O sea, eh, yo creo que es tiempo de reconocer el esfuerzo la resistencia, la lucha que se viene haciendo desde las comunidades para producir alimento, para producir esa igualdad de justicia que nosotras tanto buscamos desde las comunidades, pero también para producir ese cambio social, ese cambio político, ese cambio donde nos vean que todas las mujeres eh, tenemos derecho a todos los derechos y que no se siga segregando solamente a quienes tienen privilegio de acceder a derecho. Eh, cuando hablamos eh, de aborto, debe ser visto como el derecho de todas las mujeres y como nosotras, todas las mujeres, también vamos a tener acceso y que se puedan quitar un poco eh, la palabra de privilegio eh, y que todo entonces tengamos esa, esa oportunidad de acceder a derecho y que los estados cumplan con garantizar y nosotras cumplimos con acceder a, a derechos. Y yo creo que en ese historial nosotras todas hemos andado. Eh, nosotras como mujeres campesinas eh, hemos, hemos hecho aportes significativos a la economía social, a la economía mundial, aunque no sea reconocida. Igual, el asunto de los cuidados, de nosotras las mujeres, esa economía de cuidado que nosotras eh, realizamos de forma gratuita, que no es remunerada, pero que tampoco es reconocida, es tiempo de el reconocimiento a lo que nosotras aportamos a este sistema y que si el sistema permanece, eh, es gracias a la economía que nosotras movilizamos. Nosotras producimos alimentos, nosotras también eh, hacemos ese aporte significativo en los cuidados. Entonces, eh, no quería dejar pasar eh, por alto que nosotras eh, no solamente luchamos, resistimos y existimos, como siempre he dicho, a través de esa resiliencia en nuestras comunidades, que aún no tenemos caminos vecinales, sabemos darlo el todo por el todo dentro de nuestras comunidades sin tener que emigrar, y aún sin servicio de salud, sabemos acudir a la medicina tradicional, a la, esa medicina ancestral, porque hemos creado esa resiliencia y esa resistencia dentro de nuestras comunidades, a pesar de todas las dificultades enormes que venimos atravesando. Y saludar enormemente a esa medicina tradicional que salió eh, en las pandemias COVID-19, que no fue visibilizada, pero que estuvo ahí, que en las comunidades sabíamos más o menos cómo enfrentar eh, la COVID-19 eh, y, y eso hay que saludarlo. ¿Cómo lo hacemos? ¿Cómo resistimos desde nuestra manera de ser? Y ahorita decían, nosotros apostamos por un Estado que despenalice el aborto, no solamente en tres causales, que es lo que estamos diciendo en República Dominicana, sino en su totalidad, porque es el derecho a la autonomía del cuerpo. Pero también reconocemos esos esos conocimientos ancestrales de cómo hacerlo aun cuando está penalizado. Cómo nosotras las mujeres seguimos sumergiendo en ese proceso de garantizar y cómo nosotras también tomamos autonomía de nuestro cuerpo aun cuando el Estado se opone a que nosotras nos enfrentemos a, a, a las élites poderosas. Eh, yo siempre he dicho, el aborto va a existir porque nosotras las mujeres eh, tenemos todos los conocimientos necesarios. Ahora bien, la clandestinidad no es lo justo para nosotras. O sea, necesitamos despenalización del aborto. En tres causales en República Dominicana, necesitamos que nuestra América Latina y nuestra América siga avanzando en materia de derecho, que no caigamos en el retroceso. 
que los pueblos, todos, todos, seamos uno, una, eh, que Kathy, todas las mujeres, mientras exista Kathy, violencia en un rinconcito del mundo, va a existir violencia para todas las mujeres, porque ha sido una lucha eh, continua, ha sido una, un esfuerzo, han habido mucha sangre derramada y, y existen mujeres que lo damos todo por el todo para una sociedad más justa, más igualitaria, donde todas, todos tengamos acceso a lo básico, a lo mínimo. Entonces, en busca de esa igualdad palpable, no solamente de discurso, porque muchas nos movilizamos. Tati, perdona que te interrumpe, pero tienes que ir terminando. Ah, perfecto. Sí, no, parece que no muchas, me escucha eh, Para ah, ir okay, concluyendo, sí. muchas nos movilizamos porque entendemos que es una lucha justa y otras nos movilizamos porque sufrimos en carne propia las desigualdades con las que los estados nos tratan. Eh, hablar eh, de que República Dominicana dejen morir a una niña, a una mujer en estado de gestación cuando su vida corre peligro por no darle la oportunidad de decidir eso todavía sigue siendo violencia, no solamente para la mujer en República Dominicana, sino para todas las mujeres del mundo y debe de ser visto así. El llamado es a la unidad, a estar bien atenta a, a cualquier brecha de retroceso en nuestra América y a la resistencia y lucha, las movilizaciones en la calle, eh, siempre nos darán la victoria y lo ha dicho el tiempo. Entonces... En República Dominicana las causales van por la vida, por la salud y la dignidad de todas las mujeres. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Gracias, muchísimas gracias, Katy, por esa presentación tan importante y por las conexiones que hiciste, por all the connections we, you have been making with the rest of the panel. Uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time, but we do want to hear from you at least one or two questions before we go. We do want to remind you also that at 12.15, we have the Feminist Honorary uh, Award, and it's also with a decolonial feminist, one of the most important ones in Latin America and the Caribbean, Ochi Curiel. So our suggestion is going to be for you to you know, like when we wrap up in a few minutes, basically run <laughs> to get some food from the food trucks and then come back to the room so that we can get started at 12.15. We have uh, a mic here in the middle of the room and there's another mic circulating. And we do have a question in the chat already. We have two questions in the chat. So I'm going to ask the panelists to see which questions they want to answer see, since we don't have questions in, in person here. Okay, you do have a question. Get closer to the, to the mic. Yeah, we can start with, with this question. Okay, give me a, a few minutes just to see uh, the panelists, which questions they want to answer to the two that we have in the chat. Oh, you don't see them? Can you see them here? I can, I'm going to read them then. We have a question that says, how do we expand and bring together our struggles in the context of an ongoing war in Europe and rising religious fundamentalism and anti-secular forces on the rise? And Kathy and some of the other panelists also refer to this movement uh, against human rights all over the world. Uh, who wants to answer that question, either on Zoom or here in the room? Okay, Manisha. I think almost all the presenters, is it on? It's on? Yeah, it's yeah. on, just okay. get closer. Uh, I think all the presenters already mentioned that, several of them particularly, you know, uh, that all that we can do is reach out in solidarity. And I think uh, there are lots of movements uh, that have done that, not just for Ukraine, but for Syria, for others. And I think the important thing, in, a lot of, uh, there's been a lot written about it, is the way in which, particularly in Europe, the European countries and Poland have responded to refugees from Ukraine versus refugees from Syria or Afghanistan uh, is important. And I think that's a reminder uh, of the ways in which uh, racism still, you know, becomes part of the way in how we ref 
uh, receive the other and uh, how hospitable we are. Uh, but I think all we can do is to be consciously remind ourselves of those gaps and to continue to reach out. And I think several of the groups already mentioned uh, those kinds of solidarities across borders. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, I was thinking that in um, the various uh, cases we heard about, you know, it, it has never been easy. And, you know, um, many of the cases uh, addressed are contexts that experience authoritarian uh, governments, uh, dictatorships, imprisonment, illegal <laughs> imprisonment. Um, and I think that people have always found a way to, to resist. Women have found a way to resist even in confinement, even um, in situations of extreme um, oppression. So I think that it is important not to be um, you know, let uh, you know this rise or this backlash. Uh, you know, conservative. Or, uh, you know, just to to to to make people not to organize is the very opposite. This is the time to organize. Um, to be very clear um, about, you know, the struggle, about the need to be in solidarity, about the need to work through, uh, you know, the differences, the disagreements within movement without losing sight of what are the forces um, that, you know, these progressive movements are up against. And, you know, not to, um, just like, like we don't need homogeneous or you know for people to think all the same to unite in a vision for for social justice i think so um that, those are my thoughts now <laughs> okay okay thank you thank you barbara okay so i'm going to read the second question from uh from the chat the virtual our the virtual side of the conference and then i'm going to ask otherwise to briefly say her so that our panelists can respond to both, okay? So Erika is asking uh, how to translate community needs and particularities, particularities to transnational actors. And I'm just going to leave it there. The panelists think about who wants to uh, respond to that and otherwise. Uh, this is um, a question for Dr. Barbara Sutton specifically, um, looking at the legislation of abortion in Argentina. Uh, I am from Bolivia and it is being articulated to come up with a new abortion project where uh, the perspectives of women with disabilities and uh, the problem of inter interdiction, interdiction is considered. So I wanted to know what was the experience in Argentina uh, with this perspective of disability and women who are forced to get abortions. Okay, let's, um, actually, let's start with that question and then come back to the panel. Thank you. Thanks for that important question. Um, yes, in Argentina, um, the perspective of uh, women with disabilities was important in shaping actually the debate and and the you know the the, the wording of, for example, of, of the law that was coming from the movement. Uh, I mean, the, government, the law that ultimately came um, took a lot of you know, those experiences, but um, so for example, one, one way in which um, it influenced was that in um, previous iterations of the law project that, um, that was coming from, from this campaign, um, there were references, for example, um, to uh, fetal mal malformations, and and so there was this discussion about what, whether that could be interpreted from a, a eugenist um, lens, and so that word, wording was taken out. But it was taken out because there was, you know, as other things that change in the process in these democratic forums. Um, so, um, and and then uh, in the struggle of also for for abortion rights. Uh, there was also an effort, um, you know, even like in the in the communication of uh, of the you know of the strategies, or you know, even in the in the kerchiefs, like to um, access also um, people with different um, abilities, different you know disability status to um, to be part of the of the movement. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Does anybody here? Yeah. Sure. Sm. Um, so I, I actually see this question as, as connected to the, the earlier question in the, in the chat. 
um, of how to translate community needs to transnational action um, or actors. I, I, I think that it's very important to um, continue kind of locating uh, violence, right? This, these, uh, the connective tissues of, of violence, right? So if we are able to name what that violence ultimately is, we're able to build more authentic connections to other people who are experiencing violence, even if it's outside of the context of the community that you're in. So if you're speaking about uh, autonomy and, and um, access to health and, you know, these services, I think it's important to realize that, of course, you know, this, this extends outside of of our immediate locations. And it also uh, perhaps ways that we are advocating are actually premised on enacting that same form of violence to someone else. And so perhaps we can get rid of that, right? And in this way, I'm thinking of carcerality, um, uh, you know, which is a revocation of one's autonomy um, uh, and dignity. But I, I also think it's important to acknowledge that there are these different relationships that we have to uh, oppression. Um, so that we can deconstruct this, this uh, hierarchical and, and zero-sum kind of mode of thinking as if our oppressions are not related. Um, so rather than thinking of like some oppression Olympics and I'm this and you're this and, and I can't be free if you're free, right? Like you have to get rid of that in order to move to a coalitional politic. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Um, and that was precisely one of the themes also in all the interventions, right? So about being strategic and about building uh, solidarity. And, and just to remind you, we're talking about, you know, the experiences from Argentina, from Colombia, from India, Turkey, you know, Africa as a whole in terms of experiences, the Dominican Republic. We have, you know, people, flying from London, people on Zoom. And this has been really an honor to chair and help with this experience. Thank you so much to everyone who is here in the room and on Zoom.